Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Strang, and welcome to The Strang Report. I've been privileged recently to interview some pretty high-profile people. You may remember my interview with Dennis Prager and also with Glenn Beck. Well, today I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Steve Turley, who has more than a million subscribers to his Turley Talk, and it's something I subscribe to, and I had the opportunity to interview him, even though I'm doing focus mostly on my new book. But in a way, it ties together. Now, he is a secular commentator with deep religious beliefs, as you'll hear in my interview. It was such a great interview that we went way beyond the 25 minutes or so I usually do. And so we are going to break this into two parts. Now you're going to see the first part where we really talk about what's happening, the culture and so forth. And then the second part, which I'll post as a separate YouTube uh, video and podcast, is going to be more on the spiritual aspect. You don't want to miss either one of them, but stay tuned for my interview, my exclusive interview with Dr. Steve Turley of Turley Talks. Welcome to The Strike Report with Stephen Strang, the founder of Charisma. The Strang Report aims to encourage you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and to discuss spiritual issues facing the church, our nation, and the world. Well, Dr. Steve Turley, thank you for being on my podcast. I told you before we started that I actually watch your podcast with some regularity and uh, have a lot of respect for what you've built up over the years. And your podcast is different. It's positive. You can actually watch it and feel good. <laughs> After watching the mainstream media, uh, you get the feeling that we're losing. But you you have built a quite a following saying, hey, we're winning. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, thanks, Stephen, for me, for just the, the honor of being with you. Um, but that's right. Yeah, I it's, it's something I, I started my now. What is it? I started in 2016. So we're getting to seven years of, uh, of making the, the same argument, the long sustained argument. It's actually relatively, uh, relatively uh, simple. And that is the uh, a new world is rising, uh, a very, very different world from the one that we we're living in currently, because it's a world that's going back to nation, culture, custom, tradition, most particularly our religious traditions. And so it's what it's doing is it's in effect fusing sort of technology with tradition. So it's keeping the technology that we've amassed over the last uh, couple of hundred years, particularly in the modernist uh, West. But unlike the modernist West, it doesn't it doesn't pit tradition and technology against each other. I like to say it's more of a world like Star Wars than it is Star Trek. Star Trek could care less about religion. It could care less about faith. It's it is it is a modernist techies dream. It's a Christopher Hitchens dream, as it were. But Star Wars is mystical. It's it's run by a, an evil emperor who's who's in charge with these these eternal forces and so on. And then to fight against them, well, we're using you know the uh, the weapons, physical weapons and so forth. But the uh, the the true Jedi recognize it's a much deeper battle uh, between the forces of evil and. Um, this world that's rising is much more like that. It sees technology and tradition as being uh, uh, concomitant with each other. They, they belong together. There's a technical term called archaeofuture. Uh, some have even called it techno-primitive. But the world that we're seeing emerge is a very civilizational, traditionalist world that's rising. Unfortunately, we're going to be one of the last ones to get there because we've been the in the West, the United States in particular, we've been on the apex of the modern secular uh, revolution that's been going on since the 18th century. Um, so we'll be one of the last ones to get, but we're going to get there. We're already seeing signs of it in all kinds of places in our nation. Well, regularly. I'm going to drill down on that. Yeah. And that Comparison to Star Trek and Star Wars is very interesting, in in my opinion. And, um, you know, you defy all the stereotypes. You're a college professor, at least you have been, um, and you're not super, super woke, you know. <laughs> um, my 
you know, not that you'd care, but my own father was a college professor at a, at several Christian colleges. So I kind of grew up with that. Uh, you're very intellectual, but I don't think you come across, you're not anti-intellectual, but you don't come across as an egghead on your, right. your, uh, podcast. So, and, and also with all due respect to my late father, college professors are usually boring. They just are, <laughs> you right. know, they, they can't handle themselves in front of a camera. They can handle themselves in front of a class or in a maybe academic argument, but how in the world did you get from, uh, that world and, and being educated in England and different things that I found when I researched you to, to where you are now? It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really unlikely, uh, uh, journey, but, um, you know, in the end, uh, well, first, my first degree was in classical guitar. That's, um, I met my wife at a music conservatory. So, uh, I have degrees in music and theology. So I like to say I went where the money is, you know, <laughs> ha ha. Right. Um, but I think being a performer, I, I did have to learn how to engage with an audience. So I think I learned back uh, in my early 20s, uh, all the way up to my early 30s when I was a professional classical guitarist. I mean, I had to learn how to engage with an audience. So that was that was one thing. Um, when I was when I when we started having a family, I started having children. I knew I didn't I knew as much as I loved music. I knew that was not the profession for me. I didn't want to have to travel every week, 40, 50 weeks out of the year to make a living. That was no way to raise a family. And I was already studying theology uh, formally through a seminary. And an, a job opening uh, came about at a classical school, which I didn't even really know what was. And so classical schools is this amazing renaissance of education, the education that defined Western civilization for 2,200 years, I would find out. Um, all of our great classical, or all of our great Christian minds of the past, going all the way up to someone like C.S. Lewis or something, were all educated classically. And that's where you learn the great books and Latin and Greek and theology is the center that holds a worldview together. Um, we have a renaissance of those schools going on right now. Around 1994, there are only about 10 classical schools. Now they estimate there's over 700 in our, our nation. It's absolutely wow. amazing. So I got caught up on that. This was around 2002. I got caught up in that wave, and I really was attracted to teaching there because it emphasized truth, goodness, and beauty, so I could really stress my uh, love of aesthetics. But in a theological and Christian context, which, you know, the classical music world's kind of lacking, <laughs> to, to say the least. The arts of croissant world is, is about as bad as the university world on that. So that it was just, it was a way I could raise, as a place I could raise my family, all four of my kids went there and the like. So I taught there for a number of years, got my PhD. Uh, I did a lot of study on what's called post-secular studies we could talk about. And this is a field of scholarship. Uh, that recognizes that the world that we're seeing is actually getting much, much, much more religious, perhaps more religious than we've ever imagined in, in terms of just a religious renewal. And this, we're talking all across the board, it, it, you know, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism, Shintoism, you name it. Uh, it's just this, it's this extraordinary move uh, of where, again, out of a modern secular age into a postmodern, post-secular age. And I remember it's just around, it was around the, the 2016 campaign. And I remember the, just listening to commentators on Trump in particular, right when he threw his hat in the ring. And a lot of them didn't quite understand Trump. They didn't know really what sense to make of him. He wasn't talking in the traditional sort of neocon way that someone like a Ted Cruz was was talking or a Marco Rubio. And I remember especially a lot of, uh, you know, Christian um, radio conservative commentators not understanding Trump. They weren't they weren't getting this nationalist, populist, traditionalist paradigm he was drawing from. So I, I had a good friend of mine who was in charge of marketing at the classical school, and he was this online genius. He was just amazing with social media. 
And I said to him, you know, I'm feeling really frustrated here. And he supported Trump at the time, sort of supported Trump very early as I did, because I saw him as Pat Buchanan 2.0. And I was a big Pat Buchanan fan back in the day. I, I saw him as really the first post-globalist candidate, ironically, him and Ross Perot, but Ross Perot didn't have the traditionalist element to him. So I, I said, you know, they don't really understand what's going on with it. I wish there was a way I could kind of just communicate that frustration and maybe give a counterpoint. And he suggested I start a YouTube channel and, 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 and put out my analysis of, of the election and so forth. I, I threw it away. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Months went by. The frustration continued to build. Trump got the nomination, obviously. Um, but there was still the party didn't the Republican Party didn't quite know what to make of it. Brexit had happened on June 23rd, 2016. And Brexit, I would was arguing, were the same what animated Brexit were the same dynamics that were animating Trump. A new post-globalist world is rising and it's changing everything. And God So in other words, you you sort of figured this out yourself. It wasn't that you were part of a cohort of intellectuals who thought this through it, uh, uh, books it was, have been written about it, of course, but yeah, you're, it really, was, you it, came to this realization yourself. It was, it was through the help of the post-secular scholars. So the post-secular scholars weren't writing about Trump per se. They are just providing the frames of analysis that helped me make sense of Trump because they recognized that uh, uh, the globalist world was creating a sense of border insecurity among more and more populations. They felt more and more vulnerable as they saw their borders disappear, both economically as, as well as in terms of mass immigration. They were getting uh, economically insecure when they're seeing their manufacturing jobs go overseas, seeing all this finance reallocate in urban areas that were getting gentrified, leaving rural populations highly un unemployed. And then they were seeing this extraordinary uh, cultural insecurity emerge because they were seeing the, the traditions and the customs and the faith that they've loved uh, for, for generations recast as bigoted and racist and all kinds of phobic. And they just could, couldn't recognize the country that they were living in anymore. So these are these are post secular scholars talking this way, and then you listen to a Trump speech, and what he's saying, what is he saying? We're going to build a wall, we're going to bring manufacturing back home, and we're going to say Merry Christmas, and we're going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And you're like, it's all there. This is what people are, and they're more. And I was frustrated because. God bless them, but a lot of these radio personalities were more fixated on his personal life and so forth. Not that that doesn't matter, but uh, I, I think we had to understand that one's political uh, policies and, and, and political platforms is an extension of one's moral character. I think there is a fundamental difference between someone who has very conservative, uh, timeless political sentiments who nevertheless has yet to learn how to live up to those objective standards in their private life versus someone who is woke, leftist, insane political sentiments and is also you know, pretty crazy in their private life as well. There's a one is inconsistent. The one is horrifyingly consistent. Let's put it that way. And so. So, yeah. So I just I found that those were the frames of reference that I could use to not just analyze Trump and analyze Brexit, analyze all these elections that were happening in Europe at the same time and Austria and Bulgaria and so and France, uh, the the uh, the tension with uh, with the EU, what I call the bullies in Brussels, the European Union, uh, understanding the rise of Putin, under understanding why China was going back to Confucianism. Uh, the rise of uh, Hindu nationalism in India or in a sort of a neo-Ottomian identity in Turkey. It was this was a paradigm I, I found that could be used in a very fruitful way and hopefully bring some optimism to our analysis. And I think that it did. And what you say about Trump is interests me a lot because I've written four books about Trump. And, um, wow. you know, I yeah. I'm a Christian journalist. I've always covered things from. Um, you know, the Christian perspective, that's my background, that's my audience. And I have seen very much what you said about, you call them radio commentators, um, you know, sort of the James Dobsons of the world. 
Uh, and you're right, in, in Christian conservative circles, if somebody has several divorces and is known to have affairs or accused of it or whatever, they're just persona non grata. Exactly. And um, in fact, a lot of the evangelical leaders, you know, those are Bible believing people who at sure. least try to follow the Bible. They were for Ted Cruz. Right. You know, yeah. other than a bad word here or there, Ted Cruz is, you know, has pretty, pretty solid bona fides. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, and I backed Ted Cruz because I knew it was going to take somebody really, really, really tough and almost mean to upset yeah. things in, in Washington or even to survive. Yeah. Um, the thing that interested me is that there were a number of Pentecostal modern day prophets, people who say the Lord speaks to them, yep. who said 10 years before that God yep. was raising up someone to be a trumpet. A lot yep. of times it was kind of in figurative terms, but then more specifically about Trump himself and as how could this be? Yes. Um, but, but for me, it was his policies. I could, I could overlook the fact he had been married three times and I'm a very strong proponent of marriage. I've been, I'm still with the first wife. I mean, not just <laughs> as, as am I, yes. <laughs> yes, but sir. I mean, that's what I believe, but I could look that over because he yes. supported the policies that I were, thought were important. And he at least stood up to the bullies. Right. Now, if you talk to some people, you talk about the seven major uh, areas of influence in our culture, mm -hmm. including the government, the business, mm -hmm. arts and entertainment, media, the church, the family. It's like the other side, the lefties dominate almost all of them. That's, and, and in the last few years, they've started canceling. I mean, there's always been cancellation to some extent, but my last book, was called God and Cancel Culture. Mm -hmm. And I basically talked about how bad everything was. And I learned that everybody, at least my readers, know how bad everything was and they didn't want to be reminded. So I'm I'm encouraged yeah. by you. You know, you you watch, it's like going into Alice in, uh, Alice in Wonderland. I mean, <laughs> watching your podcast is wonderful. <laughs> the good guys are winning. The bad guys are losing. I love your expression called go woke, go broke. <laughs> now, right. other people have said that. Did you? I don't even know who came up. No, with that I didn't coin that. I, I heard that as well on the grapevine. <laughs> yeah. I would, I should, I could have TM'd it, I guess. But <laughs> and, and my favorite thing lately is Dylan Mulvaney. If I see yeah. that you've written about Dylan Mulvaney, I'll oh tune my. in to see what wild thing you have to say about that. Oh my. But you know, with Budweiser, it looked like they, they wouldn't back off and then they backed off a little bit and now they're trying to cozy up to the left and they're real concerned about their ESG score and all that kind of stuff. If, in fact, let me interrupt this very intellectual and let's take a rabbit trail to talk <laughs> about Dylan. Where did that come from? You know, here you've got this B-level actor. I looked yeah. on YouTube and he has a fairly decent singing voice, at least in my opinion. And then he came out as non-binary. And then the next thing you come out is as a little girl or something. I mean, where is he just looking for attention or is this part of something bigger? And where in the world is that trend going the other way? We used to never hear about transvestites. Now we see them in public libraries reading uh, stories to little children. It's very interesting, and it's and it's difficult to figure out what on earth is happening here, other than you know just a Romans one. You know, they just uh, God's given them over to to reprobate mind at this point. Uh, it's you know we have to remember that for decades we were told that logic was um, a form of uh, racism. You know, we, we found out math this year was racist, right? And uh, feminists have been arguing that logic is uh, has been a patriarchal tool for domination for a couple of decades now. And and I undermine, I mean, again, just to get a sense, these are academics who are, this is key, arguing that, that logic is somehow 
patriarchal and racist, right? So, I mean, just uh, listeners this, can I obviously- I took a course on <laughs> logic when I was in university. It was required. Of but course. They, it wasn't this kind of logic that you're talking about. Of course. And and then the absurdity is they have to use logic to argue against logic. It's just, you know, it's crazy. Aristotle figured that out, right? You know, I could prove the law of non-contradiction uh, to you in a heartbeat. Just argue with me. You've proven my point, you know. You're taking one position over it against its opposite. So in many respects, I just think the uh, the art of thinking has died uh, on the left. And so now it's just pure intimidation on the one hand. But then there is this, um, yeah, there is, there is a, once you've lost the capacity to make distinctions, once you've lost logic, you've lost the capacity to make a distinction. A is not non-A. Uh, that, and, and again, nobody can argue against it without arguing for it. If you say, no, I don't believe that, and I say, yes, you do, and you say, no, I don't, you're proving my point. A is not non-A, right? You're going back and forth. But uh, it's also, it's not just a law of thought, it's a law of being. So if I were to draw a box, and I would put, uh, I would put Stephen in there, and then outside that box, I draw a much, much, much bigger box, and I put non-Stephen out there. Well, what's included in Stephen? Well, you know, broadcaster, you know, husband, father, man, uh, you know, citizen, blah, 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 all these attributes. Well, what's in non Stephen? Well, you know, uh, women, um, uh, what I don't want to even say, uh, garbage collectors, you know, uh, you name it, presidents, uh, uh, trees, flowers, rabbits, quasars, you name it. Now, if I were to erase that original small box and say, now there's no difference between A and non-A. Logic is racist or logic is, is patriarchal. There's no difference between A and non-A. Well, now you're a man, you're a broadcaster, and you're a tree, and you're a squirrel, and you're, you see, it just, it all, the, the sense of reality begins to implode in on itself. And the rest of the world is laughing at us. This is one of the, advantages of having an international analysis 90 percent of the world and that's not an exaggeration we're only about 17 percent of the world's population right now the west was 30 percent of the world just over 30 percent the beginning of the 20th century because of our adoption of lifestyle values we are demographically imploding and so except for the conservative christians which is again one of the most optimistic parts of things conservative christians are having more kids than ever in the west and that's why we're taking over but uh, the the uh, the the liberal side of the West, starting with Europe, but now it just caught up with the United States back in 2008 when we went under the 2.1 replacement level as an aggregate. Um, what we what we began to see is that the percentage of the West, uh, the percentage the West makes up of the overall global population, just shrank dramatically. So we're we're going to be no more than 10 percent of the global population by 2050. So when I say 90% of the world, including a lot of us here in the West, is looking at us and, and just absolutely shaking their head going, you guys have gone insane. I'm not exaggerating. That's what, Putin has been able to weaponize that for right or for wrong. He has been able to weaponize that in his campaign to take Eastern Ukraine by basically saying we are emancipating ourselves from the globalist West that's trying to impose its woke values through NATO. NATO is a, an instrument of imposing liberal woke values. Now, he could be totally lying. He could be totally, we can, we can be completely cynical over that. The fact that when he talks that way, 90% of the country, 90% of the world goes, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Shows just how much we've lost the respect of uh, the moral respect of the population. So I think it's a combination of just the fact that we've lost the capacity to think. Uh, and, uh, and I think too, that we're, what we're seeing is just uh, this incredible descent um, of, uh, of American leadership capacity that we did have very strongly in our own Western sphere during the Cold War and then in the world the post 1991. We had it, but we've we've lost it with these woke values. And so I've I've over, I, I remember after Obergefell passed uh, that legalized uh, same sex marriage. I said, guys, you don't understand. I was telling some people that were more on the left, center left. They weren't they're not extreme. But I, I just I tried to explain to him, you don't understand what kind 
of geopolitical disaster this is. The rest of the world is looking at this saying that that's it. They've lost their their minds. This is the beginning of the end for these guys because they're all going to traditional family values. That's the new thing right now, especially it's, it's totally practical just to try to overcome the demographic winter that so much of the world has gone through in the 20th century. They recognize in order to get their population vibrancy back, they have to adopt pro-life measures like Viktor Orban in Hungary is doing or the Law and Justice Party in Poland is doing or the, uh, the, uh, in, um, in Georgia and even Putin. Uh, and of course, China has to do it now because of their disastrous one-child policy and the rampant abortion that accompanied that. So th these are the things that I think in the end we don't realize that when we, we push these woke values, we are actually engaged in committing sort of international suicide in terms of our prestige in the uh, geopolitical world. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And of course, we had to break it into two parts. It was just interesting that the second part was mostly on the spiritual things, which, of course, is the topic of my book. We did talk about it a little bit. And I've often said to myself, if Steve uh, Turley can be so bullish on the fact that the, the world, as he describes it, is kind of shifting to the right, I need to be as more bullish about the power of the Holy Spirit to not only change people's lives, but to affect our culture. And uh, I'm encouraged by what he has to say, and I hope you'll be encouraged about my book. You can get it on stevestrangbooks.com, also on mycharismashop.com. It's available really most places that Christian books are sold. It actually releases on May 16th. I know a lot of you will see this afterwards, but I am, I am passionate to get out the word about this book. I'm going to be traveling, and we're all also going to post this partly because I'm not able to do a live uh, podcast every day. So I want you to check out my book. I hope you'll share it with friends. I hope you'll be motivated. I hope it'll cause you to want more of the Lord in your life which is available through the power of the Holy Spirit for the asking, as I explain in my book. And remember, tune in again. Look for it on my YouTube channel for the second part of this very important. Boy, he enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. We just kept talking. And so we'll share the next one on the next episode of The Strang Report. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for hitting the little bell, which will notify you when I have a uh, podcast coming up. I really appreciate you. Send me your ideas. Send me your uh, comments. God bless you. And tune in again tomorrow for another episode of The Strang Report. Thank you for listening to The Strang Report with Stephen Strang. Stay up to date with the latest episodes by subscribing on YouTube and Rumble, as well as your favorite podcast app at cpnshows.com. Get the latest reports delivered directly to your inbox by subscribing to the newsletter at strangreport.com. In an upside down world, there is only one way to stay grounded. Life is full of twists and turns, successes and setbacks. How can you reach your God-given potential and achieve your dreams? With over four decades of reporting on the move of the Holy Spirit around the world, Stephen E. Strang has firsthand experience of how the Holy Spirit has led him on a remarkable journey of faith and a successful life. In his new book, Spirit-Led Living in an Upside-Down World, he will invest his true life lessons into the hearts of readers as he reveals his secrets to having a successful life led by the Holy Spirit. Go to booksbystevestrang.com to pre-order your copy today.